This is the best of Golick and Wingo podcast. Good Thursday morning. Glad you're with us. Golick and Wingo, ESPN Radio and ESPN2. We are always presented by Progressive Insurance. All phone guests join us on the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. Mike Golick, Trey Wingo here. You, my man, look stellar today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Got my hair cut. Got a haircut. Well, I have to get ready for that the, my Orange Theory workout that my wife and I do. Uh, we have to do a mile run today for time. So what does that have to do with a haircut? Seriously? Yeah. When you run, you know, less drag. So just shave it off then. Well, I don't want to shave it off. Shave don't off tell this, you about this. drag on your no, haircut. No, I got to you know, take away the drag so I can go faster. See, here I am. Yeah. I'm, I'm coming uh-huh. in. I'm complimenting because yeah. I'm thinking, you know, at our age, right. whenever you can get a haircut, it's right. a good thing. Right, right, right. And right, you're right, going right. to get haircuts longer than me. I, I, I see that how mm-hmm. that's going to go mm-hmm. in my future. But I did not expect the wild U-turn of, yes, I got the haircut because I needed to be more drag efficient. It's for performance. <laughs> It's all for perform- performance. So it's not a PED. It's no. a, it's a PEH. That's a, a performance enhancing haircut. That's exactly right. Okay. If you, you ha- if you had a minute and 41 seconds that? into the show where it completely devolved, and, congratulations today. You're the and, winner. And, I, and if I were D'Antoni, I would have gone with the sorry, I'm not sorry. Yeah. With you know, that. instead of the, some yeah. people don't like the way you play sorry out of it. Sorry, I'm not sorry. And we're, I'm, suckers. I'm going to keep being not yeah. sorry about it as it looks like we may be having something in the Western Conference finals that we thought we might not have. Because they're just being them. Yeah. We're just being us. And we're ju- we just yeah. want to be us. Yeah. We're glad you're with us. Golik and Wingo presented by Dollar Shave Club. Upgrade to shaving with a fresh blade whenever you want for a fraction of the price. Join DollarShaveClub.com today and we start with what's trending. And what's trending is Houston in an upward direction. The Rockets beat the Warriors 127-105, giving Golden State its fourth worst playoff loss under head coach Steve Kerr. But while the result was different from game one, the formula, Man, Mike, was the same. It really was. So I'm sure a lot of people are going to go, well, they obviously played a little differently. They didn't play so much of that ISO game. Nope. And it, it turns out, it turns out most of the numbers are exactly the same. Assist opportunities, game one to game two, both 35. Isolations, game one, 45, game two, 46. Passes, game one, 231, game two, 233. What they did is they just spread it out a little more. Instead of 26 ISOs for Harden, he had 16. Paul went from 10 to 16. The rest of the team went from 9 to 14. Just more guys did it, and then they hit more guys with open passes. Right. And, oh, by the way, guys made their shot, something they're still looking for in Cleveland right. for the other guys, the other guys, as they say, to make their shots. You know, that's what they're looking for, where last night you get the Trevor Reeses putting in 19, the P.J. Tuckers putting in 22. You know, the the, the, the uh, Eric Gordon, he had a monster night, puts in 27, guys hitting their shots. More opportunities, same formula, looked a little different, but one thing else that was the same that we're going to get to, yeah. they still picked on Steph, Steph Curry on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, there's a lot of actually yeah. fascinating yeah. discussion to have about Steph right now because of what he has been, what he is doing, and maybe more importantly, what he isn't doing, right. uh, both offensively and defensively for Golden State. We'll get to that in a little bit, but we can't, Mike, we can't talk about Game 2 of the Western Conference Finals without one... Okay, do Uh, it. Again, the same number of assist opportunities, ran one more isolation play, and just two more passes. That's it. So Mm -hmm. basically, they did the exact same thing. Exact same thing. And and it worked out this time because they were making their shots. But the real question comes, do we believe this was a one-game, hey, we're ticked off because we got steamrolled in the first game, or do we believe this is something we can continue to do? You know, here's the thing. I mean, they won 65 games. They're a really good team, and they're going to play their way. That thought of them playing a different way after game one was no. a ridiculous thought. It was. That they have to play like exactly who they are. But like anything else, you have your star in Harden, but other guys need to step up. And other guys stepped up last night. We've seen also the formula for Golden State when you get a little fat and happy, yeah. like they do to you know, win game one, you start to feel good about yourself, they turn the ball over. Right. 15 turnovers, what, 7 in the first quarter, 11 in the first half. So they got a little sloppy, maybe got a little full of themselves, and they couldn't get back in this one because of the hot shooting from Houston. And as the clock runs out, I'm just going to say one thing really quickly, yeah. okay? Uh, GM Del Morey, the Rockets, has said we're obsessed with finding five ways to beat them. Yeah. I think they're doing like everything the Warriors have done. Remember the series against the Pelicans? Uh, who was it? Draymond Green texted Kevin Durant, Kevin Durant late night and said, Hey, Ben, you got to do this. Well, apparently PJ Tucker got a call from James Harden at 1 a.m. Yeah. yeah. So if it worked for Golden State doing the late night conversation over a phone, either a phone or a text, we're going to do it in Houston, do the same thing. Big difference. PJ Tucker didn't answer the phone. That's also true. Yeah. As we continue what's trending, as they say in hockey, let's do that hockey. 
Long live Chance the Rapper. The Golden Knights defeated the Jets 4-2 to to take a 2-1 series lead. Jonathan Marcheseau started and finished the scoring for Vegas as he became the first player in NHL history to score in the first and last 60 seconds of the same Stanley Cup playoff game. And let's just throw a Vegas, and you know what else is in Vegas with the whole gambling thing going on. That last goal he got, yeah. which was the empty netter, the over-under on that game. Was five. Was five. Yeah. Well, well, no, I'm sorry. They posted a total of the, the, put the game over the posted total of five and a half. There you go. So with that empty netter, it went over over the five and a half. You got to love it being in Vegas. But he yeah. does lead Vegas with eight goals and nine assists. This postseason, those 17 points are one shy of matching the NHL record for most by a player in a team's first playoff appearance. And the thing about it is the Jets have been getting shots like crazy in the second, third period. Way more shots than the Golden Knights. So, you know, again, we look at goaltending and how well, how good it can be. And, and we, continue, we continue to see it for Vegas uh, going up in this series now two games to one. So now Vegas is just two wins away from doing mm-hmm. something that was last done in the NHL by the St. Louis Blues in the 67-68 season. An expansion team making it all the way to the, the Stanley Cup Finals. However, again... Uh, hashtag, asterisk, parenthesis, yeah, whatever you want to do. Yeah. Uh, that year, the entire Western Conference was an expansion. Yeah, so they were all expansion. Yeah. It was going to happen. It just right. was which one of these guys was right. going to do it. It's a little different with what the Golden Knights are doing, and congratulations to them as they are now two games away from playing for the Chalice. It's the Stanley Cup. Well, 2817 seems like a long, long, long time ago for the Dodgers. The Marlins beat the Dodgers 6-5 last night, sending L.A. into last place in the NOS by percentage points and 10 games, Mike, below 500 for the season. Yeah, not not good. It's the earliest date they've reached that mark since 1929. Ouch. And oh, by the way, the quickest to reach 10 games under 500 in baseball history in a season after winning 100 games, they have tied the 1986 Cardinals in yeah. four, uh, doing it in 42 games. By the way, they stink. Uh, <laughs> Wait, but, was that but, was that was that an opinion? Was it, by the way, they stink. They stink, and they weren't supposed to. The Marlins were supposed to stink. They right, had exactly. the exact same record. Exactly. The Marlins going into the season had five hundred one odds, worse than baseball, uh, to get to win the World Series. The Dodgers were nine to two. Yeah, tied for the best in baseball. So tied for the best to the worst, and they had the exact same record. They had wow. Game Seven at their place at the World Series last year. Basically, the same team comes back now. Turner. Uh, is Turner back yet? Yeah, Turner's back from the the, the injury. So they're, they're just sort of rounding into form. But again, the only teams with a lower winning percentage than the Dodgers, who represented the National League in the World Series last year, the Cincinnati Reds are winning at a three forty one clip, and uh, Bubble Boy Devin's White Sox uh, at under three hundred uh, at two fifty six winning percentage are the only teams with the oh and the Orioles, the Orioles. Those three teams are the only three teams with a lower a uh, winning uh, winner percentage. By the way, the, yeah. the Reds just swept the Dodgers. Exactly right. <laughs> and you know who doesn't like that? Who's that? Uh, that would be uh, Bubble Boy's favorite player, a soon-to-be White Sox outfielder, not pitcher. Eli. Hey, baby, go White Sox. Mm-hmm. Go, go Sox, baby. There you go. So that's what you can say. Hey, we're not going well, but we're almost as bad as the Dodgers were, and they went to the World Series a year ago. There you go. That's the rallying cry. Spin it forward, my For the friends. White Sox. Spin right it now. forward. Glass half full. Well, or it's just full of something. It's a dribble glass. That might be our sippy cup. Mm-hmm. One, one, of, one, there you of, go. one of those two things. Okay, so Houston's James Harden, Cleveland's LeBron James, and New Orleans' Anthony Davis mm-hmm. are the finalists for the MVP award this year, which will be given out... June 25th in a televised show in L.A. Yeah, so they made the show out of the start of this last year. Yeah, a lot of the sports are doing. I think it's a cool thing. It just seems so weird so far after. Now, it's it's not that far after the finals, but these are all regular season awards. Right. And the regular season has been over for, I believe, about a year and a half uh, <laughs> because the playoffs are so long. But there you go. Those are your three finalists for MVP. Rookie of the Year, your finalists are Ben Simmons, Donovan Mitchell, and Jason Tatum, who, if you wanted to do that one, including the playoffs. I think we all know where that would go. Yeah, that's exactly right. Most improved, Victor Oladipo, Capella, uh, and Dinwiddie from Spencer Dinwiddie. Sixth man, Eric Gordon, Lou Williams, Fred Van Vliet. Coach of the year, Brad Stevens, Quinn Snyder, and Dwayne Casey, who doesn't have a team. 
Uh, and Defensive Player of the Year, Anthony Davis, Joel Embiid, and Rudy Gobert. Those are your finalists, again, for their televised uh, uh, award show at the end of June. Cool thing. I do like the award show. I, I do. I, look, thing. Yeah. I think they're trying to do what the NFL does with the uh, NFL Honors, yep. that yep. whole thing, which is done Super Bowl week, <laughs> the Saturday before the Super Bowl. You know, it is interesting in looking at these three guys that are up for the MVP. Um, I think we all know where the bronze medal's going, and that would be to Anthony Davis. Uh, so it's really the gold and silver thing between Harden and LeBron. And I do, again, find it interesting. Last year, Russell Westbrook won the MVP essentially because he averaged a triple-double for a year, which hadn't been done since Oscar Robertson in the right. early 60s. And then Russell Westbrook did it for a second straight year, right. and we are so over that already. I mean, we have just seamlessly moved on from yeah, that. Yeah, we have. Yeah, we have. Not, not even in that. the top three. Yeah. is not going to be on the podium, even though he's done something that no one had ever done before. And how quickly we turned on the idea of how special that was. Yeah. Like, yeah, that happened last year. It was special because it was done so long ago. Exactly. All of a sudden, not so special. It was done last year. But but he's done it twice in a row, which has Listen, never happened before. I get it. I'm it's like you. we moved on from the black and gold dressed and blue and white dressed to the Yanni Laurel thing. That's exactly. And now we right. moved on. Yeah. He became Yanni Laurel in yeah. a year. That's exactly you what just happened. Move on. Move on to the next thing. And we then, don't even remember the, the, the black and white and dress. Cliff or still or thinks I'm lying when I hear Yanni. Yeah. So I say, Cliff, for crying out loud! That's just the way it is. Uh, I, I, hear the, I hear Yanni, and that's all there is to it. Okay, so uh, that was what's trending. But you know what's going to be trending in about a month? Mm-hmm. The single greatest thing in the history of the world. Go and wing, go leadership retreat! Again, this is the greatest corporate scam of all time. I'm amazed. Yeah. I'm absolutely amazed how we pulled it off, but yet we did. We were pulled off the Golica Wingo Offsite All Hands Town Hall Leadership Retreat Strategy Session Golf Tournament. Uh, basically, we're going to Pinehurst and we're golfing, Correct. and you guys get a chance to come with us. And none of us are paying for any of it. That's ah, the beautiful thing. That is the beautiful thing. So here you go. You can enter uh, st- from today uh, all the way till Friday, May 25th. All right. There's going to be four winners. What you're going to get is a three day. Two night trip to Pinehurst Resort in Pinehurst, North Carolina. Round trip airfare for you and two guests. We'll explain. Yes. Premium accommodations at Pinehurst Resort, including hotels, meals, a ton of swag as well. This is going to be June 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. Basically, you're going to go down there. There's going to be four winners and each winner will get to bring two people. So you're making a threesome and then we'll, we'll continue. We'll, we'll fill the foursome out for golf. Right. With Trey on one team, myself on another, my son Mike on one, and Stu Gotts from the Dan Lebitard show. Maybe. Most likely, Maybe. unless yeah. he screws it up, Correct. and we'll see if he screws it up today when he joins us. So really, we're giving 12 people an opportunity. That's, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So four winners, you get to bring two guests each, and this is how you do it. You get one entry, gang, one entry, and one entry only. You have to be following us at Golik and Wingo, our Twitter handle. So you're going to tweet to us, and you're going to hashtag it, Golf with GW Contest. You get one entry, one tweet. You can make it whatever you want. A picture, a video, just write something to us, whatever you want, but make it good. Stand out. Yes. Think outside of the box thinking, originality. Real real corporate thoughts. That's what we're looking for here. That's what we need. And then, gang, your golf in Pinehurst number two. I mean, for you golfing freaks out there, you know what that means. It's one of the best. They've held multiple U.S. Opens there. They, it's one of the most iconic courses in all of America uh, for a couple of reasons. One, all the greens are basically upside down saucers or cups, so you have to get it on there and and hope it stays there because a lot of things roll off. Whatever. They, don't, they don't have any rough either. Hey, guys. They have let's all not this forget stuff. This and, is and, a leadership retreat. Okay. Talk a little bit about the name game. Uh, the name game? The yeah. name game. Uh, we will try and name the people that are in our... Foursome. We will name our foursome. Yes, and we will name our carts. We will. Our, our, my carts can be named Gladys. I'm going to name the beer cart. Yeah, the name will be mine. Yes. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and and then we'll name each beer that we yeah. have in our system. Everything will be named. Yes. We'll no name. No worries everything. about that. And we'll even have a mission statement at some yeah. point. Which you was... will learn so much at this that you'll be able to take back to your workplace yeah. if you remember anything. Yeah. So we'll go off in Pinehurst too, and the Cradle. Which is a nine hole short course, fun course. Very, right? very cool. All par threes, All really, par threes. really good. There have been fifty hole in ones. And I can say from our group there will after this trip there will be fifty hole yeah, in ones. Unless we hit one of the luckiest shots of all time. That's so again, true. gang, four winners. And you each bring two people with you. Tweet to at Golik and Wingo. Hashtag it. Golf with GW contest. One shot. Tweet us. Video picture whatever you want whatever you feel will grab our attention to make you a winner june 21st 22nd 23rd in pinehurst with us and you will be a part of 
Really, it's just a scam just to play golf. Stick in your head. There dude. you go. You're going to be so disgusted with that. Theme. You will, and we're going to make sure we drive that yep. point home. A goal can win. Go, but presented by Progressive Insurance. Protecting your small business is a big deal. Cover what you've worked so hard for. Visit progressivecommercial.com. And maybe it was the progressive thinking, Mike, mm-hmm. of Rockets head coach Mike <laughs> D'Antoni that led to the game two win after the game one humiliation uh, when they got smoked at home by Golden State by 13 points. But they came back and they showed a little fire. Yeah, they did. And you know, all the good words, gumption. There was some gumption from the Houston Rockets last night. And Mike D'Antoni says it happened because we didn't change a damn thing. We are who we are, and we had to be who we are. We just did it better, longer. Guys believe it, and we're not going to change anything up. Uh, that, would be, that would be silly on my part to panic. I mean, you, you don't do that. Uh, we're very comfortable about who we are, and we can beat anybody, anywhere, at any time, playing the way we play. Now, some people might not like it. You know, hey, sorry. <laughs> oh, come on. That was a sorry I'm not sorry. That's exactly you know, that was what the, he should have been. That was the Fizdale. You know, how's that for dad? I pound it and walk off. That was a sorry I'm not sorry and leave. That you know is what I mean? Ex- that is exactly right. But I, I do love the fact that Dan Tony preached that message to his team and just said, you know, like, uh, like t- take for example, Ty Lu after game one is like, well, we have to look at everything. We might start Tristan Thompson, which they did. They're changing this, all this. The Rockets are like, hell well, no. Well, they, they, you know what they were? They were Stephen A. Smith, basically, saying, oh, hell no. Oh, hell no. We're just going to be who we are. Yeah, uh, that's exactly right. The difference, the difference being is Cleveland yeah. changed basically their entire team at the trade deadline Correct. and are still trying to figure out all the pieces. Houston has all the pieces. They know where all the pieces go. It's just how well they're going to play. Yep. You know, it's a game in this game. Again, they're a huge numbers team and a huge three-point shooting team. You know what else they, they are? What's they're that? a huge second spectrum stats team. <laughs> They created 12 unassisted, uncontested threes, I should say, and made six of them in this game. Game one, they only uh, created five of those and just made two. So, again, they did the same things, but they moved the ball a lot to different people. Harden wasn't the main man, dribble, 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 iso 26 times like he did in game one. They spread it out to other guys on the floor. They were driving more, and we'll get into it. They were driving on Curry an awful lot. Yep. And they were hitting open guys, and these guys were knocking down their shots. And that is exactly what Tim Legler said was the difference in game one. It was ball movement. Ball movement, infinitely better. They get 73 points tonight out of guys named P.J. Tucker, Trevor Ariza, Clint Capella, and Eric Gordon. The confidence level that those guys played with and the aggressiveness offensively, was next level. I just thought they took it to Golden State from the jump. They never let up. They were beating them off the dribble repeatedly all night long. Golden State really never recovered. They never hit you with that big run in the second half to make it a, you know, six, eight point game where maybe Houston feels the pressure. Golden State was not able to do it. They cut it to 10. And then before you knew it, it was 20 game over. And you know, the way everybody were, were talking about this game, it makes yeah. it sound just like Harden didn't play. No, he you know, played, because everything, he played every, fine. He still took the most shots. He took 24 shots. He took 15 threes in this game. He shot nine of 24 and three from 15. He didn't shoot well, but he still shot. He still led uh, the Rockets in points of 27 while Durant led everybody with 38. There was only one other person. That was Steph Curry in double digits for, uh, Golden State. We'll get to their side of, of the, uh, of the ball. Uh, but yeah, Harden still shot a lot, still took the most, still did his thing, but it, t- it just got to more people. More people got involved. And this is what, again, what we talk about with Cleveland when it's not Harden doing it all the time. When you get other people involved, they have to hit their shots. That's the same thing you say in Cleveland. That Corver's got to hit his shots. Right. That, uh, J.R. Smith has to hit his shots. Kevin Love has to be the man. Uh, and, and that's something they didn't get. Well, Love was certainly is holding up his end of the bargain. Others aren't hitting their shots, but so Harden was less involved as far as the ISOs, more players were involved and they came through. So I, I understand Antonio saying, listen, this is us. This is the way we play. And when we play like this, we're hard to beat. Yeah, you sure are. Yeah. You got 65 wins. It's exactly right. Yeah. I don't think you're going to win the series, no. but I completely understand your thought process of how you're going to play. I, I do like the fact that Houston got a little angry. You know, they yeah. got a little yeah. angry with Defiant, themselves. Didn't yes, they? exactly. That's why gumption is the greatest word. Plus, mm-hmm. it's in Houston. All Texans have gumption. There That's just go. the way it is. Mm-hmm. But it's almost the exact opposite of what happened in Game 1, where there was so much balance scoring uh, for the Warriors. As you said, you only had two guys in double digits. Yeah. That's so rare. The Rockets had five. Including, you know, four, 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 four of their five starters right. and Gordon off the bench sure. had 27 to match Harden's 27. So, I mean, that, that's what we're talking about. If it, 
it seems like whichever team has the most balanced scoring attack has done well in this series and so far. And Steve Kerr knows exactly what happened last night. I just think this game was a matter of uh, the Rockets bringing the, the force um, that's necessary to win a game. And, and we didn't. You know, we had seven turnovers, I think, in the first quarter. We set the tone um, early with our own play and um, allowed them to get some confidence and um, some easy buckets in transition. You know, we let guys get gone a little bit. Um, but, you know, give them the credit. They came out and played uh, a great game, and they got everybody going. And so they got, uh, you know, we got what we deserved. So they they kicked our butts. No other way to say it. I love that. We got what we deserved. Well, and they did. And But I love how he talks about it and Dan Tony talks about it is these are the two best teams in the West, maybe the two best teams in the NBA. Correct. And it's always starts from... What did we do? Right. Okay, they beat us. They yeah. did their thing. But Golden State knows that they play their best game, they're going to win. Right. Houston believes that they play their best game, they're going to win. So it's all about what we're going to do. Now, we didn't do what we are supposed to do. They took advantage of it. But it always starts with what we are going to do and should do because we feel we're the best team out there. Yeah, and, and look, for fans... Let's all hope that this continues to play like this because this is the series we all wanted, yeah, right? Yeah, we wanted. When, so we wanted to get to this point. We were a little disappointed after after how easily Golden State won Game One. But if we can we can get this going, I, I'll sign up for this series for seven games right now. If we can get this thing going yeah, back and forth, be nice. I, I don't know if I'm real hopeful, but it'd be nice. I, I'm not sure either because that was the third playoff loss together with yeah. Steph Curry and Kevin Durant on the floor uh, over all this the two seasons they played together, and now the Rockets have to win three of the next five. Yeah. Not so sure. However, we may have seen a trend over the first two games that gives Houston a little more hope and better odds than you think. Hashtag sports gambling. Golick. Golick and Wingo. And Wingo. Mm-hmm. Trey Wingo and Mike Golick Sr. As soon as this weather breaks. What flop Fridays, baby? Are you kidding me? Thong Thursday? No, okay, no. I mean, absolutely. No. Where are the thong? People are eating. Oil up. Well, it's Thursday. I have a thong on right now. <sighs> Sports Center brought to you by Post It. If you work on a hot or rainy job site, you know how tough it can be to communicate clearly. But new Post It Extreme Notes are water resistant and extra sticky. So now you can get your message said and get the job done in any weather condition. New Post It Extreme Notes. Buy them today. We continue with you, Golden and Wingo, ESPN Radio and ESPN2. And there are certain things that are just very, 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 very difficult to do. One of them is throwing a perfect game in Major League Baseball. 27 up, 27 down. No walks, no runs, no hits, nothing. And 20 years ago today, on May 17th, 1998, Yankees Fisher, pitcher David Wells did exactly that. It came three days before his 25th birthday, and it was the 30, it's 35th birthday, excuse me, and it was his 15th perfect game in the history of Major League Baseball, and here's how it sounded on the Yankees radio network with John Sterling. The 0-1, swung on, he's going to get it, popped up to right field, O'Neal near the line, he makes the catch, David Wells, David Wells has pitched a perfect game, 27 up, 27 down, baseball immortality for David Wells, and the Yankees win, the Yankees win! It was amazing, and in David Wells' autobiography, 2003, Perfect I'm Not, he admitted that he pitched that perfect game with, quote, half drunk, with bloodshot eyes, monster breath, and a raging, skull-rattling hangover, having gone to bed at 5 a.m. the night, the morning of. The morning of, morning that's exactly, of, there's no night before And there. gotten just an hour of sleep. Yeah. So if you're wondering to yourself, how does a guy in New York yeah. only get an hour of sleep before mm-hmm. he has to start? Yeah. Well, that's because the night before... He went to the Saturday Night Live post party, baby. Something you know a whole lot about, again, and people didn't know, uh, Trey starting in this business was a page yep. at NBC, and part of his gig was you ended up at this party at Saturday Night Live after the show. Yeah, not this one specifically. No, but no, that, no, yeah, no, no. That would have been great. Yeah, I, I, I would have been here at that time. But, but no, you, you know where these parties go. Yeah, look. As you th- said, you don't dip a toe into these. No, this is not a party that you sort of walk into and say, I'll just drop by. Because the show ends at 1 a.m. on the East Coast, and then everybody hangs around backstage at Studio 8H at 30 Rock for a while, and then they take their makeup off, and they kibitz, blah, blah, then they change, they do all this stuff. So they don't really get to the party until sometime after 2 o'clock in the morning. And then the party doesn't really get started 
until about 2.30 or 3. Mm-hmm. So it, it becomes quite a thing. And there's a great story on Complex.com. It's an oral history uh-huh. of... Uh, of uh, Read what you can read. Yeah. Because some like, things you can't. Like Marsha Klein, the Saturday Night Live producer, asked David Wells, said, hey, why don't you come by the party? And Wells said, no, not this time. I'm pitching tomorrow. And she went on to say, you know, I have, you have to come. Dennis Rodman came once, and the next day was one of his best games of his career, 25 rebounds or something like that. And Wells says, I can't say she called me a blank, but I can't say she didn't. Yeah. So I went, <laughs> and I look around, and there's Jimmy Fallon and Will Forte and Fred, Fred Armisen, and one thing led to another. And then Marsha Klein says, he was there all the time. But I remember him being there specifically that night because the next day he threw the perfect game. There are a few guys who came a lot, Tino Martinez, David Cohn, but David was the ringleader. I remember giving David a hand massage. A hand massage. He said, you know, I'm pitching tomorrow. Well, I said, let me massage your hand. So Wells says, I think I got home at 5.30, probably got two and a half to an hour's sleep. I knew this was not good, so I just tried to stay away from everybody was worried that someone might get high off the fumes. Oh, my God! I had consumed a lot of alcohol. I was a dummy, but I just got caught up in the moment. You can thank Marsha Klein for that. I had a job to do, so I went out there and I did it. I was the one who put myself in that predicament. Before the game, my bullpen was horrific. Just threw two balls out of the stadium because I was so frustrated. I could not throw a curveball and got to the point where I just quit throwing. I said, that's it. And from that... He threw a perfect game. That's amazing. I I, I love his 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 commitment. Yeah. No, I have to pitch tomorrow. Oh, come on. All right, I'll come. <laughs> he, he stood strong <laughs> in the test of adversity. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is amazing. By the way, that day at the stadium, full of uh, four, 49,820 people, tons of kids. It was a Beanie Baby promotion. Oh. The be- I have a ton of Beanie Babies. I'd like to know what they're worth. By the way, yeah, uh, a Beanie Baby promotion on that day as he is. Doing nothing but sweating alcohol out of his yeah. body. Yeah. The amount of alcohol sweat had to be unbelievable. But I, I, I you know, I, you're flushing the system. You're I wonder the if system. there was during that night as he was partying, were there thoughts of, man, I need to leave. Yeah. Man, I got to pitch tomorrow. And at what point that just left his mind completely? Well, you, you know, there's <laughs> always that one one moment in every time we've all been down there when you say. I'll just have one more. Oh yeah, and yeah. The worst line you can ever say to yourself is. I'll just have one more because I'll just have this one last one and then I'll go. And it's that one last one that makes you forget everything else you said the night before or the moments before where I'll just have one more. So unbelievable. 20 years ago today, David Wells completely, not over, not really still hung over, hung over and hammered at the same time through a perfect game in Major League Baseball. Coming up, are the Rockets back in it? Plus a great entry point for a new head coach. That's mm. it. Celebrate David Wells Day. We're back. <laughs> Golick. Uh, I tell you what, a great sports night last night. Yeah. No doubt about it. And Wingo. What a day, what a show, what a time. One, two, three, four. Hey everyone, Mike Golick here. Support for the Golick Wingo podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. Rocket Mortgage is simple, allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash mics. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org number 3030. Washing my nose, oh yeah. I'm a shower curtain, and I do one thing, keep water from leaking everywhere. So you see why I feel useless compared to Geico, who does so much more. Like, not only could Geico save you money, but they've been around for over 75 years. And they give you 24-7 access online, over the phone, or on the Geico app. And they've got a 97% customer satisfaction rating. They do all this while I have to listen to this chucklehead. Oh, good, he stopped. Oh, great, an encore. Geico. Expect great savings and a whole lot more. Golik and Wingo on ESPN Radio and ESPN News, presented by Progressive Insurance. All phone guests join us on the Shell Pencil at Performance Line. So, a uh, little, little behind the curtains thing here. Behind, uh, in every commercial break, I get up and walk around. Yes, you do. Keep energy going, keep, keep my legs going. The reason I did that is because the first month I did this show, mm-hmm. I think I put on 10 pounds. Really? 10 pounds. Because I'd sit on my large butt. Yes, you do. For four hours. Yep. Then I would go upstairs, take a nap in my uh-huh. office, then go do NFL Live for right, an hour right. and a half. And go home like just so there's a lot of lot of sitting, a lot of but I was exhausted. Sedentary. And then when we got to Hawaii, I tried to put on some shorts and like, nope, that's not happening. No, 
So I've now made this thing where I try and walk in between every commercial break. Uh-huh. And now Brett and Dan Stanzik, the bruiser, start walking with me. Really? So we go walk around the halls just to keep the energy flowing, getting going. And I looked at them and I said, you know what we've become? Yeah. We're mall walkers. <clears throat> we, we have become mall walkers. Can That's I, what uh, we're doing. Can I let you on a little secret? Yeah. They're not walking with you because they want to walk with you. Oh, I know. They're you know walking. why they're walking with no, you? No, I don't know. Because occasionally you come back after a segment has started. Yeah, that's true. They want to make sure that's, you that's get fair. back here in time. That's 100% awesome. fair. I, mean, that, I, I totally yeah, get that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. But, but, but anyway, we, we, we are mall walking. <laughs> yes, you, so are. you know, I'm preparing. <laughs> I, the next thing, I'm searching for the perfect frozen yogurt. That's, that's the oh, next step that's in this evolutionary then, huh? process yeah, yeah. is what's going <laughs> on. Okay, uh, let's do some loaded questions. Let's. You ready? Loaded questions brought to you by GNC. Ignite what's inside you at GNC. Buy two, get one free for a limited time. GNC. Live well, and we live well with our pseudo mall walking. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, guess who's going to be the voice of loaded questions? Who? That would be researcher Brett. Stunner. Because he hasn't been on the show yet today. It's been over 90 minutes, and he feels the need to weigh in. So, researcher <laughs> Brett, the stage is yours. All right. Who wins more games, the Browns this season or the Cavs the rest of the postseason? Okay, so the, there's the potential for the Cavs to win eight more games. In the postseason. Yeah, but I, There's I, the potential. I personally don't think they're getting out of this round now. Being down yeah. two zip and the way they're playing and the, more importantly, I'd say the way Boston is playing. So I, I, how many games do you think the Cavs are going to win in this postseason? Well, I, I, I guess my point is if I don't think they're going to get out of this series, the most they can win is three games. Right. I, I'm going to go with three. Means, which I'm means go with the three. Browns would have to win more than three games, yeah. which I think they can do. Yeah. So you're going to say the, you're going to say the Browns. I think I'm going to say the Browns. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure I disagree with you. Uh, and I don't even, that, that's provided the Cavs still win three games. Yes. They may only win one, may win none, may win two. I, I feel pretty strongly like Cleveland will find a way to scrap and hold home court. I, I feel, I believe, I believe that. I think, I, I think they will. So you think it's going to be a 2 2 series going back to Boston? I think it just might. Wow. I think it just might. Cause what well, we have Jackie McMullen on yesterday? I, I, and she what? said the Celtics are a completely different team on the road, did the same thing against the Bucks in round one. That's very true. And maybe I'm, I'm giving up. And I shouldn't be because yeah. it's my hometown team. Damn it, Mike, stick by your team. I, I know, but just watching, man, I mean, it just does not no, it look doesn't. good for Cleveland. It, it doesn't. But I, I think that somehow, some way, they'll 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 make this to a game six. I'm going to the Browns, though. You're, you're going, to the, going to the Browns. I think I'm going to the Browns too because okay. I've said all along I think that they're going to win games this year. Again, they've won one over the last two years, but I'm going to go four or five wins for the Browns this year. All right, which would be would be epic. incredible. It would be fantastic. Yeah. All right. Next loaded question, Brett. True or false, Brad Stevens is getting too much credit for the Celtics' success. Well, don't ask Robert Parrish that one. Yeah, Big Chief has no yeah, interest in yeah, that. Yeah, he, he, he wonders if Brad's getting a little too much love, said how many championships has he won. Uh, I, I'm going to say false to that. I mean, he's getting a lot of love, but I, I'll still say it's the players on the court that are doing the work, obviously, and they're the ones that deserve more uh, than the coach. The coach could put you in the right spot, certainly, and call great plays, especially those out-of-bounds plays uh, that he's been calling. So I, I, I think he's not getting too much credit. I think he deserves the, the credit that he's getting. Uh, I don't think anybody's saying, you know what, it's – Kyrie Irving or Brad Stevens, you know, let's get rid of the let's get rid of the players over the yeah. coach, you know, just yet. But I I do think he's an excellent coach, so I'll say false to that. Yeah, I I don't understand why people are upset yeah. with the credit he's getting. They don't. I, I the, think they don't like the genius word that's going around. Yeah, but it was one of his own players that did it. It wasn't somebody in the media. I believe it was Al Horford who's been in this league a long time and yeah. said he's a genius, and not one person in the Celtics locker room said that's ridiculous. I think they're all buying into it, and if they're all buying into it. That alone makes means he's doing a great job. Right, so right. sorry, Chief. You had a great series. I love you, Robert Parrish. You always look like you were smelling something bad when you played. But uh, I, I just I just feel like he's getting the proper amount of credit. I think he's doing a great job. Mm-hmm. So I think that's completely false. All right. Next question. Let's do it. Finish this sentence. Trading Kyrie Irving to the Spurs for Kawhi Leonard would be stupid. Yeah. I mean, are you serious? And this is all based on Terry Rozier coming in and playing incredibly well. Okay. I mean, we saw, didn't we see that with Isaiah Thomas last year in Boston? I know he had the bad hip and I, you know, I want to put that on Rogier to say it's not going to be. Rogier is playing very well right now. Okay. He's playing very well. He's gone from averaging one point, uh, uh, two years ago to five points last year to 11 points this year. And I know he's hitting some big shots and he's playing well. You're going to trade away Kyrie. Now I know you're going to have to pay Kyrie and obviously he's not playing now because of the injury, but come on. Well, let me just, let me give you a little background information. Go ahead. That That is a hot take from somebody on the staff, and that's how it made it into a load of questions. Oh, okay. You know whose hot take it was? No. You want to take a guess? I don't care. Bubble Boy. 
Oh, really? Bubble Boy. The guy who didn't know what, what position yeah. his favorite player in the White Sox farm system, Eloy Jimenez, played. Yeah. That was his hot take. Stop this now. Yeah. This is insane. Okay? I love Terry Rozier, and he's playing great. But can imagine how much better the Celtics would be with Terry Rozier and Kyrie Irving and Gordon Hayward. You don't need Kawhi Leonard for this team to be as good as it's going to be. Again, yeah. they're probably going to the finals yeah. without their two best players. Exactly. I don't think you need to reshuffle the deck and bring in Kawhi Leonard as good as, as good as he is. They have plenty of players. And once they get Hayward. And those young and wing guys, I yes, mean, gosh. They're going yeah. to be fine. And ru- new, new rule on loaded questions. Devin does not get to submit a loaded question. Good point. That's just the way we go. All, All right. right. Next one. <laughs> That's NBA insider bu- bubble boy to you. <laughs> okay. On a scale of one to ten, how much will the eighth pick in the NBA draft influence LeBron's decision this summer? For the record, our draft analyst, Jonathan Cavoni, has the Cavs taking Michael Porter Jr. from Missouri. Uh, on a scale of one to ten, it would be zero. Yeah. It would be absolutely positively none, nothing, not a zippo of what that pick will mean to LeBron's decision. I, think, I don't even know I need to go any more than that. Yeah. Nothing. That's one to ten. You, you can't pick zero. Zero. I pick zero. So people get I a, laugh at your one to pe- ten scale. People get on me zero. for breaking the rules in love it or shove it, and you just blatantly threw out the rules. Give it a one to ten. One. There you go. Thank you very much. One. Uh, although I'm with you, I think it's completely yeah. zero. <laughs> I, just want, I just want to be. I just want someone else to be a, yeah. be mad for breaking the rules. <laughs> Here's why I don't think it matters because I if they had gotten a top three pick, I think it might have mattered. Okay, who can we bring in here? Right. But the fact they're picking eighth, I don't think they're going to get a difference maker because LeBron is looking around. I mean, again, let's just go back to what happened in game two. And you can, you can fault him in the second half for settling for jumpers and maybe not hustling back on defense all the time. That's fine. But nobody else played 82 games in the regular season and plays more minutes than anybody else. He had a 40 point triple double, Listen. the third of his playoff career, the most ever in NBA history. And they still got smoked. The only people that LeBron is looking at, it's not rookies. It's going to be veterans that they can sign who he thinks can help or that they can trade for who can help immediately. He doesn't care about the rookies. Correct. I agree. Uh, I think he knows this team as it's presently constructed. He has to decide, do I want to stay and play in Cleveland and try and win him another championship and hope it gets better? Or in my 16th year, do I need to go somewhere where I can try and win that fourth championship? I think we all feel pretty strongly that option B is the way he's going to Hope be Hope it doesn't happen, but boy, oh boy, it'd be tough to think. But as a Cleveland say. fan, the fact that he came back and yeah. brought you to three finals yeah. and won a championship, you can't fault him, no, right? No, 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 absolutely You can't not. fault him. No, you cannot. I mean, no. at this point, look, Agreed. you saw how much different the Warriors are and how dominant yeah. they've been as soon as they got that one other superstar, Kevin Durant. Now put LeBron in that right. situation. You have to feel like, hey, thank you, appreciate it. You did what you you said you were, you were coming to do. You did it, but God bless you, and we'll see what happens right. going forward. And Wingo. Let's not expect too much. There's only one person out there that's expecting way too much out of this guy too early. We know who that is. It's his father. Uh, Stu, welcome. Uh, first of all, I was listening the other day, and, and despite a 40 point triple double from LeBron James, you believe LeBron James shares a, a big part of the blame for the loss in game two to Boston. Uh, yeah, good morning, guys, and very impressive swim breakdown there by Mike Golick. Very good impressive. forever. Mike Golick knows more. It's incredible. I mean, he knows more about Ledecky than I know about anything. I mean, that was that was amazing, Mike. I'm very impressed. Uh, guys, you have to, like, LeBron has to share in some of the blame because he was great offensively. He's always great offensively. I think he can give you that stat line basically any time that he wants to give you that stat line. But defensively, and I'm not just talking about the second half because I know everyone's criticizing the Cavs defense and LeBron and the way he played defense in the second half, for me, it went to the first half. Like, it started right there. And the end of that first half, with those last two possessions in which LeBron turned the ball over, complete disaster. But on defense, he was not moving. He was not sliding. He was not helping. He was allowing guys free lanes to the basket. It was really odd to see from a guy that we consider to be one of the greatest players of all time. But this is LeBron in his final season. Like, guys, you just left to wonder what's going through his head. You know, the, the lottery's right before the game. Is LeBron thinking, hey, I'm getting out of here. I'm not staying here. That draft pick's not high enough for us. You just don't know what he's thinking. And that's the mystery that surrounds LeBron James every time he's in a free agency year. But he certainly deserves a good portion of the blame for how poorly they play defensively. Because, guys, it starts at the top. If your best player, the guy who's carried you to this point, is going to play like that defensively, chances are 
Kyle Korver, J.R. Smith, Tristan Thompson, the rest of the team's going to play the same way. So it starts with LeBron James. So if it, it, first off, do you think he'll be in Cleveland next year? And if you do not, where do you think he will land? Uh, I do not think he'll be in Cleveland next year. I think he's already made that decision. And so, listen, Brian Windhorst was on with us the other day. He got mad at me when I said that. Um, you know, for me, it's interesting. If you go back to when he left Cleveland the first time, all the stories were that LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, all those guys, they had those conversations two years in advance at the Olympic Games. And then when he left here in Miami, uh, Stephen A. Smith came on the radio and told us that LeBron James had planned that exit for two years in advance. So I think his whole career has kind of been laid out by him and his friends, and they're great. Like, they keep it interesting. Everyone's always wondering where LeBron's going to go. Uh, but, guys, I don't think he's going to stay in Cleveland. I think if the Rockets don't win an NBA championship here, I can see him going to Houston, and I can see him going to Philadelphia. I think those are the two most likely teams. Yeah, Mike, I, do you think he's staying? Mike, do you think he's staying there? No, I, I don't. I, I was one hanging on to think he was going to stay, hanging on to think he could still get him to the finals, but right. I, I don't see either one happening. Yeah, I, I do not see him staying in Cleveland. I don't think he feels he has a shot in Cleveland. And the eighth pick in Wait, that but draft Mike, probably are, are you ba- are, Right, okay. But are you bailing on the series? Are you saying that this is it? Like, LeBron's done. The Cavs are done. Are you bailing on them and this series here? Yeah, I am. I, I don't think they're going to come back and really? win this series. I, I, I just don't. I don't think, what, no matter what he does offensively, I don't think he's going to get enough help. They're way, way, way too inconsistent, I think, to, to get four wins in, in, against a team that plays so well, that's so athletic, that's so long. Not the greatest shooters in the world, but, but at times they shoot well, but they make up for it on the defensive side. They are just agitators on the defensive side. I don't think Cleveland can overcome it this time. But also not as good on the road. Listen, here's the thing. Here's the tricky thing about LeBron James. And Boston, not as good on the road. So, And the tricky thing and the funny thing about the NBA playoffs is it seems, yes, it seems that like down 2-0, it seems impossible. But if they win game three at home and they blow out the Celtics, uh, all of a sudden you're saying, okay, they're a game, a home game away uh, from being 2-2. Guys, here's the tricky thing about LeBron James, okay? Here's, here's the funny thing about it. And it's the reason the LeBron and Jordan comparisons continue to exist. And they'll exist forever. Never at any point in his career did you question whether or not Michael Jordan was in a game or in a series and trying to win that game and trying to win that series. The fact that we have conversations and we look at the body language and we look at how he plays defense and we question whether or not he's going to stay in Cleveland while he's currently playing in an Eastern Conference final for the Cavaliers. The fact that you have to question his effort three or four separate times in his career, as to whether or not he's actually tanking games. I mean, that's the difference between Jordan and LeBron James. It really is. I completely, hold on, completely disagree with that. No, no that's a, nobody on yeah. this show oh, is questioning that's, his that's effort. That's you. That's, that's not you. us. That's you. That's no, not us. No We're shot. not okay. doing that. I'm not, no whoa, shot. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. Whoa, whoa. Very defensive there. I did not say you guys are doing that. No, but you, you said we're having this conversation. You're having this conversation. We're not, we're not having this no, conversation. No, I'm saying the reason this conversation exists is because of that reason. You guys might not be having it. Other people are having it. And you ask Cavalier fans if they felt like LeBron James was giving max effort that final game at Boston when he took his jersey off as he was leaving the court and then decided to come down to Miami. And then you ask Heat fans if you feel like he was giving max effort in that Spurs final the last year in Miami. Ask them because those are the conversations that fans have. Well, that, 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 that's, reason- that, that's fine. But yeah. as Bill Parcells once said, Stu Gatz, when you start listening to the fans pretty soon, you're going to be sitting with them. Yeah, but guys, no, no, but it's not just, listen, I've had the conversations. I've heard Stephen A. Smith on his radio say, uh, on his radio show say that LeBron James might not want to make it back to the finals because he doesn't want another finals loss on his resume because he knows he can't beat Golden State. Just just because Stephen A. says that doesn't mean I'm going to believe it. I think that's ridiculous. I think that is a ridiculous thought for anybody, not you, for anybody to say. I think it's ridiculous to question that. I mean, it's amazing how uh, people want to get in the minds of players and say, oh yeah, he did this because of that. Oh yeah, he did this because of that. How many times has Jordan been down 0-2 or 0-3? three in a series never you know go, going to a finals or in a finals I and I'm not saying that when you get there you should and I don't think he tanked them but we're talking about the effort I get Jordan's never right. been in that position that could be a feather in his cap as well but just because somebody says it doesn't mean it's true I mean do we all of a sudden we think LeBron doesn't want to go to finals because he's afraid to lose another finals to me that's a joke 
I, I, I would, I would, Mike, I would disagree with anybody who said that. Mike, but it might be a joke to you, and it might be a joke to Trey, but it's not a joke to other people. But people that doesn't mean it's true. But that doesn't mean it's. It true. doesn't mean it's true, Trey. I'm not saying that it's true, but the the fact that that conversation exists amongst people who are credible, not me, Stephen A. Smith, <laughs> and others, the fact that that conversation is out there is the reason that people will never hold them up to Jordan. Well, the fact that's that, that's all I'm saying. No, I know. All we're saying is the fact that it's out there is that people have platforms and they need to fill for us. Yeah, I, I, I would put I mean, that more on the people saying it well, than, yeah. than, than the actual realistic conversation. I think it's do, do you joke. really believe that he wasn't giving max effort in that game against Boston in game two? Do you really believe that? Uh, do you really believe that if he won a third consecutive NBA championship with the Miami Heat that he would have went back don't, to Cleveland? Don't do you answer my question. I'm telling you right now, question. there's no way he goes back to Cleveland. Answer the question. No, no, answer here's the, the question. question. Do you believe he wasn't giving max effort in game two when he had a 40-point triple-double, the third most in NBA history, passing yes. Oscar Robertson? Yes. Uh, defensively, yes. I do not think the greatest player in the world, maybe the greatest player we've ever seen, yes. I do not think he was giving max effort on the defensive end. No, I absolutely believe that he was not playing as well as he could have played defensively. All right, we'll, just, we'll just agree James to I disagree. Seen before. LeBron we'll just James agree to just disagree. doesn't let guys get to the rim. We'll he just, doesn't do that, guys. We'll right. just agree to disagree. We'll just agree to disagree. Down the lane. Moving right. on. Okay. We'll just we'll just agree right, to disagree man, we'll on that because I think that's that. insane. Uh, Stu Gatz okay. with us, and we're happy to have him. <laughs> yes, Let's we be are. clear about that. From the Dan Levitar show with Stu Gatz. Let's move on to another superstar who people are questioning, but this time not about his heart and what he's thinking, but actually how he's playing, and that's Steph Curry. It's pretty clear that the Rockets are targeting Steph defensively, and he's only made one three-pointer in each of the first two games. Do you think he's 100% right? Uh, no, I, I don't. This is not the Steph Curry that we've, you know, that we've become accustomed to uh, over the last couple of years. This is the Steph Curry that we've become accustomed to when he looks injured, because he's been injured in a couple of postseasons here uh, in the past couple of years. I, no, I don't think Steph Curry is right. Uh, the jumper's off. The, the leg appears to be hurt. He's not. Uh, I heard the guys talking about it last night on the telecast. It just doesn't seem like he has, you know, some spring, the normal spring that he has uh, in those legs and going to the basket. So, no, and they're picking on him, Mike, as you pointed out earlier. They are absolutely trying to pick on him uh, defensively, and they should because uh, clearly he's not right. So they're just trying to get plays where it's Harden or Eric Gordon or Ariza or Paul or whomever one-on-one with Steph Curry. And so, no, I don't think he's right. I still think the Warriors win the series. Listen, all the Rockets did last night was what they were supposed to do, right? We've been waiting for this series uh, the entire year, and the Rockets have been the best team by far in basketball the entire year. So the Rockets did what they were supposed to do last night and got that series back to one game apiece. I still think the Warriors are going to win it, but Steph Curry is definitely not right, guys. Like, did you? That's not a Steph Curry you guys have seen before, right? No, it's no. not even close. No, so that's, no. that, and the thing is, uh, Stu, with, with Steph, he doesn't have to score, but so often the offense goes through him, and that's what gets everybody Correct. going. And the offense isn't going through him right now, setting everybody uh, everybody else up. It was just weird. That was only, I think, the second time ever in a postseason game with Durant and Curry. They only had two guys in double digits, and uh, you know, right. I mean, Durant, it's, it's really funny. They're also basically playing the LeBron <laughs> rules here. We'll let Kevin Durant get his thirty-eight and thirty-seven. We're just going to try and smother everybody Correct. else. Yeah, and so it worked, but in game one for the Warriors, it worked because Clay Thompson gave him a monster game. So Steph Curry was allowed to be the third best player offensively on that team in game one. In game two, that didn't happen. They didn't, they didn't really get that second score. They didn't get the big game from Clay Thompson or Draymond Green or really anyone else. So it was Kevin Durant on his own and Chris Paul couldn't deliver as the second option last night. All right. So I, I think this has actually worked perfectly into our leadership conference. We just hold spent- on. What? Yeah. Go lick and win, go leadership retreat. So we basically just spent about five minutes or so yelling at one another. So this leadership conference and retreat will help, you know, whether it's a rope course, whether it's the drinking, drinking, the golf, the golf, whatever it is, we we think it's going to help everybody and help us all come Mm -hmm. together. So your thoughts about any chance you get kicked out of, uh, of Pinehurst too for the way you may golf or act on this trip and how much you're looking forward to this? Um, I'm very much looking forward to this. I am proud of you guys. Um, what's the deal? Am I playing with one of your listeners? Is that what's happening here? Am I playing with your listeners or am I playing with our listeners? What is going on here? I'm assuming they're all listeners. We're just doing it that way. Okay. You're playing with a listener. How about that? 
Correct. We're just going to play golf at a really nice course. And there drink. it Boom. is. Is that what we're doing? Yes. By the way, okay. I, I, I am I, in. I, yeah, I feel like we have done the most Tugatsian thing of all time because it was a conversation <laughs> yes. we were having a couple of weeks ago about, hey, we'll go play golf together. And I said, let's get somebody to pay for it. And you said leadership retreat. And then Pinehurst rolled in. So I think there's a little Stugatz in all of us that made this come together. Yes. A, 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 hey, guys. And listen, I'm let's glad not you got- forget this is a leadership retreat. Talk a little bit about the name game. No. No. no, we are. We're no. going to name our foursomes. <laughs> yeah, we're going to name our carts. Okay. Yeah, and we're going to do that. Yeah. Um. Now, Stu, right, I'm not going to get Mike. I'm not going to get kicked out because of the way I play golf. Okay, I play golf fine. Right. I might get kicked out for other things because you know, just drinking and being loud and being obnoxious and giving hot takes about LeBron James and accusing him of tanking games <laughs> and people might not like that. And they might kick me out for those reasons. But my golf game will be on point. I promise you. I'm very much looking forward to this, and I'm proud of you guys because we talked out an idea. You guys followed up on that idea. I talk about a million ideas. I never follow up on any of them. So the only way this thing gets done is because of you and Trey. I'm very proud of you guys. Thank you. And I, hey, and this is great, Trey. Yes. Trey, we're playing Pinehurst, Let's man. go, baby. And I have to ask, because yes. I heard this on your show, and it was awesome. You got the table for eight at that restaurant in Boston on Mother's Day oh. at your specific yes. time, 1230. Did you actually call them and say, we're actually not coming, or did you just leave that matzo ball hanging out there? Oh no, like at the end, like we always have to ask, uh, we have to ask permission at the end to air those things. Yeah. And, uh, so at the end, I kind of break it to him like, Hey, I'm not really coming to your restaurant. I don't need the reservation. Thanks for being so playful. Uh, we'd like to air this thing if you guys are okay with it. It's great promotion for the restaurant. So it's so uh, great. Yes. Eventually I tell them, eventually I, t- I do not leave them sitting there okay. on the busiest, th- although I should do that. <laughs> that would be very oh. Stugatzian. That would be very yes. Stugatzian. Yeah. Yes. Table for eight, twelve thirty brunch, Mother's, <laughs> Mother's Day, Day, prime time, baby, and then I never cancel it. Yes, uh, that's that. Next year I will do that. Unreal. I, I got to tell you, I heard that whole thing. It's unreal. It was freaking. Hilarious. You're the best at it, and I have to shower after it every it, single time. It was. It was. <laughs> it was well done, <laughs> Stu. Thanks, Stu. Right. Appreciate you, pal. We'll right. see you next week. I mean, that all was. Right. Let's stop fighting. All right. No, yes, no, we're no, not no, fighting. Right. We're yeah. talking. We're airing our grievances. Peace, not fighting. Peace, love, golf, yes. beer, retreat. There, there you go. Uh, I tell you what, a great sports night last night, yeah. no doubt about it. And Wingo. What a day, what a show, what a time. One, two, three, four. It's a normal day. You're rushing out the door to get to work on time when suddenly, there it is, the dreaded service light. So what is it this time? Tire pressure, low coolant, time for an oil change? <sighs> When it comes to service lights, head to Jiffy Lube. We've got you covered. Drive in today and make the switch to Pennzoil. Ask for Pennzoil Synthetics. Getting you back on the road in a Jiffy. Jiffy Lube. Leave worry behind. Our next guest, who is intimately aware, especially with mm-hmm. the Cleveland Cavaliers, he's their former GM, David Griffin, co-host of Sirius XM NBA radio show Deals and Dunks at 1 p.m. Eastern on Saturday, and a former colleague of our current colleague, Amin Al-Hassan, right. uh, and as a member of the Phoenix uh, front office a few years ago. So, David, thanks for being with us. Uh, you, you, we'll do this. Dealer's choice. Would you rather start in the Western Conference or the Eastern Conference? Well, since my walk-up music was eastbound and down, let's start there. there done. Love it. Nicely done. So a lot of people, a lot of people, whether it's on Twitter or on their own platforms in certain areas of the media, are saying, well, one of the big problems for the Cleveland Cavaliers right now, especially in that Game 2 loss where LeBron had 40 points and a triple-double, was that he wasn't hustling on defense, and if he's not doing it, no one else in Cleveland is going to do it. When you hear that, what do you say? Uh, defensively, I would, I would say that's an asinine assertion. Um, I, I think if you, you watch the game and then you watch Marcus Smart even post-game in his comments, when LeBron took the shot to the chin that he did, he clearly wasn't the same when he came back. And at the moment that he takes that shot, because Cleveland is so dependent upon him to be the ball-dominant play creator for all the other pieces that really need to feed off of him, Boston identified that as when they really needed to pick up the pressure. And, and frankly, that's when they smelled blood in the water. You, you don't outscore a team 71-47 to 47 from that point on. And, and have it be a function of LeBron's defensive side of the ball by itself, they just immediately exerted their will upon the Cavs on the on the Boston defensive end, and, and Marcus Smart was truly dominant down the stretch. Why do you think there's such a lack of consistency uh, on, on the Cavs with the other players and who's going to be that guy that steps up outside of Kevin Love after LeBron? 
Well, because the team was so so heavily built around two ball dominant play creators, and right now Cleveland really only has one that they can count on, and I, I think that makes it very difficult because so many of the ancillary pieces on the roster are built to fit a team that has two play creators. It's it's sort of like Houston with Chris Paul and James Harden, and they have a bunch of ancillary pieces that feed off of that. Right now, Ty Lue can really only trust LeBron to, to put the ball on the deck and make a play. And I think because of that, what you may see him do is start to rely more on Kevin Love from the elbows, let him run some, some offense with dribble handoffs and different movements of that type that get Boston's defense moving side to side a little bit more. And don't let them just sit and load up on LeBron because, again, there's no one else creating thrust in the offense. David Griffin with us, former Cavs GM. Okay, so make the case for Cleveland to get back in this series. We know what's not happening. What do they have to do? Who are the players that has to step up to get make this a series by taking Game 3 when it goes back to Cleveland? Well, I think in much the same way that they, they fought through the Indiana series, they're going to have to bring a mental fortitude to this that I think at times – they have not because I think they've taken things for granted that they were going to make it this far, and I think they tend to have some complacency. But I think they're going to need to rely on the guys that Ty Lu knows he can trust and that have won in the future. I think you're going to see even more of Tristan Thompson, which I think is really important for them against Al Horford. Al has not traditionally been as good against Kevin and Tristan together, even going back to when he was in Atlanta. So I think you'll see more of that. But I think more than anything else, they're really going to need to lock in on the defensive side of the ball. And they just haven't built a level of trust and chemistry on that side of the ball because they had so little continuity after they made all those trades. They had so many different injuries that kept their rotations from playing any meaningful minutes together. During this break, they really need to identify who they can trust on that side of the ball and, and just start to build out from there. Knowing LeBron for the years you have, you have known him, uh, this is purely a hypothetical or guess on your part do you think he's decided where he wants to play next year or I, I should say in Cleveland or elsewhere I don't at all think he's decided I think he's so consumed with being the best basketball player on the planet and he's so consumed with winning games in the here and now I don't think he puts a lot of thought process into what comes next we all do and and I think that's from a from a media perspective, it's certainly something where everybody thinks this is a, a foregone conclusion, and I, I just don't think it's even really been something he's spent a great deal of time on. And I would love to know what the decision's going to be made based upon, uh, because that'd give us some direction on that. But I, I have no idea of that either. So we'll see how that plays out going forward in the off season. Again, he's still got a series he's trying to win, and that may turn around Game Three. But again, Boston's never lost a series. In franchise history, 37-0, and where they're up two games to none uh, in a best of seven. David Griffin with us, former Cavs GM. Let's swing it out west. Uh, look, the Rockets were great last night. They were great defensively. They smothered everybody but Durant. They played their kind of ball, as Mike D'Antoni said. Sorry, we didn't change. We're going to do what we want to do. The question then becomes, David, as long as we don't think Steph is completely out of it uh, and maybe a little more hurt than we're leading on, can they do that three more times against this team, especially when they have to do it in Golden State? Well, first of all, I, th I thought Mike D'Antoni's insistence that we are who we are and the amount of indignation he brought to the notion that they needed to do something different was sort of the equivalent of a bolo punch in boxing. He, he doesn't want you to see what the other hand is doing. <laughs> we're not going to change. We're not going to change, but we're going to move an awful lot more on the weak side. Yeah. And we're going to cut P.J. Tucker through an awful lot more. And they didn't change who they are and what they do, but they tweaked it a little bit. And I think one thing that was really meaningful and has been all playoffs long, Trevor Ariza was on the floor. If, if you take the, all of the players that have played in the playoffs, if they've played 100 minutes or more, Trevor Ariza is number one among those players in plus minus per 36 minutes. He's a truly significant player for them. And he picked up five fouls very early in that game. He was really a non-factor throughout because of the foul trouble. Trevor is really essential to what Mike wants to do, and you saw it last night. I don't know how many games someone other than Harden and Paul led them in assists throughout the season, but I would bet it's single digits. And last night, Trevor Ariza was, was tied with the lead with six assists. And so it's not just that he and P.J. Tucker totaled 41 points, 11 rebounds, and 10 assists, I think. 
It's that when the ball is coming to him, he's making the right read and the right play. And all year long, what what Houston did was they were very ISO heavy. They limited the number of passes they were throwing, which then limited the amount of turnovers they were going to create, which then limited the number of opportunities you were going to have to run against them. And then they would be a team that locked in on the defensive side and counterpunched. And that's what they got to do last night because they were so much more physical than Golden State. They just took Golden State out of all their actions. And I think Steve Steve really made a point of, of mentioning that. And you can see him sitting on the bench during the first quarter when I think they had seven turnovers through the first five minutes of the game with that look of, oh, boy, here we go again. They, they just didn't bring mental focus to the game last night. Former Cavs GM David Griffin joining us on the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. And so while you've seen many of the matchups with your team, the Cavs and Golden State, can you tell when watching Golden State when they're going to be off or what's happening on the floor that shows they're not going to have one of those nights? Yeah, and I think you can see it really early. Uh, and all year long, I, I felt like they dealt with a level of, of complacency that they had never dealt with before. Steve talked about it very often. He couldn't get the team to, to show up and play with appropriate fear, as, as he calls it, which is a Popovich term. They obviously didn't have it last night, and you could see it, like I said, within the first five minutes, the number of turnovers they had. Golden State really tells on themselves from a mental focus standpoint with the amount they throw the ball all over the place because their offense is so precise, and when they're playing well, they are so incredibly fun to watch because that movement is truly unique. The guard splits they get from Steph and Clay, some of those triangle actions that Steve Kerr brought from his Chicago days, and then getting to watch Kevin Durant, obviously, end possessions in the way he does, they can be really special. And you can tell very early on when they're going to execute at that level and when they've shown up with the appropriate fear. And against a team like Houston, you don't just overcome it if you don't. That that team's 51-5, and five, I believe, now when Capella, Harden, and Paul all play together. Yeah, they've been great together, so we'll see what happens in pivotal Game 3s for different reasons in both the Eastern and Western Conference Finals. David Griffin, former Cavs GM with us. We can't let you go without giving us a story about working with our colleague now when you guys together were in Phoenix, Amin El-Hassan. What what was he like to work with? And you can be brutally honest. (laughs) So this will not surprise anybody who's who's, uh, enjoyed the hate-hard concept of Amin El-Hassan. But Amin was not somebody who was going to hold his tongue, and it didn't matter who was in the room and whose opinion he was stepping on, and and most often it was my own. So (laughs) I I enjoyed it quite a bit. Uh, So, hey, listen, (laughs) those are the best kind of relationships. Golik and I in the breaks throw pies at each other, so it works. (laughs) We just clean up real fast. Uh, David, we appreciate you being with us this morning. Thanks so much. We'll see how it plays out this weekend. Thanks, David. Thanks, fellas. This has been the best of Golick and Wingo podcast. You can listen or subscribe on the ESPN app, Apple Podcasts, or just ask your smart speaker to play Golick and Wingo. Plus, you can check the guys out live weekday mornings from 6 to 10 Eastern on ESPN Radio and on ESPN News. Ryan! I don't know how else to say this, so I'll just say it. What is it, Linda? I think we should see other people. Are you breaking up with me on a roller coaster? Well, we do have a lot of fun. Maybe we should stay together. An emotional roller coaster? Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to GEICO. I just need a little me time. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more.